Welcome back, everyone. Um, we are going to start a panel discussion on sustainability, and I'm very happy to introduce the panel chair, Chris Madman. Uh, Chris is a division manager for artificial intelligence, analytics, and innovation development uh, organization uh, at the Information Technology and Solutions Directorate at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of NASA. He's also a director at the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, he's a director of the Information Retrieval and Data Science Group uh, here at USC Viterbi School of Engineering. And he's an adjunct research associate professor of computer science, recently adjunct research professor of computer science, congratulations, um, here at USC. And he teaches in our data science programs the introductory course on a scalable data systems. And he's going to chair this panel. Welcome, Chris, and thank you. Hey, Yolanda, thanks for having me. And uh, what a pleasure to chair this, uh, you know, esteemed panel. Uh, and so uh, basically, um, you know, we're going to get into a number of a, a very interesting topics on sustainability. It's a uh, really big on everyone's mind, I think, nowadays. Uh, and then how, you know, things like data science and artificial intelligence and automation, uh, you know, uh, could potentially help us as we kind of move forward in this uh, new world and hopefully uh, post pandemic world eventually uh, that we'll get to. So uh, I'd like to take, uh, I'll be I'll be the moderator here for this panel. I'd like to take a moment uh, to introduce our esteemed uh, panelists um, uh, and then have them, uh, after I introduce them, uh, I'll go ahead and give them some time to talk a little bit more about themselves. We've got uh, Deborah Keiter, uh, you know, Deborah is a research scientist at uh, the Information Sciences Institute, a part of Viterbi. Uh, we have uh, Mata Mogadam, who's our uh, chair of electrical and computer engineering electrophysics in the Viterbi School of Engineering and a distinguished professor uh, at USC. Uh, and we have John Wilson, who's the director of USC Spatial Sciences Institute uh, in the College of Letters, Arts and Sciences, uh, the director of the Wilson Map Lab, uh, and a professor of architecture, civil, uh, and environmental engineering and computer science. And so uh, what I'd like to do uh, with our panel is uh, kick it off by having them uh, speak for uh, about a couple minutes apiece. And then after that, I'll dive us into uh, uh, the various topics. So uh, uh, Mata, would you like to kick us off? With pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm Marta Mogadam. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering in the Viterbi School of Engineering. And although Chris, you generous, generously uh, called me the chair of the department, my it's uh, it's inter I'm not the chair. I'm a faculty member in the department. It is the the uh, I think the sometimes point of confusion is that I'm a Mingxie chair, and our department, of course, is called the Mingxie department. Uh, it's just the chair position and it's called after uh, our, um, uh, you know, you're too humble. I gave you a promotion and you're taking it away, you know, anyways, keep going. <laughs> so anyways, um, um, the director of the USC Center for Sustainability Solutions and also I serve um, on the USC President's Working Group on Sustainability. Uh, within the sustainability uh, working group of the president, there's there are multiple committees. I also chair the research committee of the president's working group, where together with leading researchers from across the campus, we're developing a roadmap for achieving the sustainability research vision for the university. Uh, so both within the center that I'm co-chairing, Center for Sustainability Solutions and the president's working group, we recognize that sustainability is a global need with a progression of local solutions and emphasis here is on solutions. Uh, it's not a one size fits all uh, when it comes to sustainability. It's all hands on deck uh, dealing with factors that impede sustainability, such as climate change. We must realize that we have to tackle problems in a large range of topics, such as health systems, transportation systems, water and energy systems, other infrastructure, the built environment, cities, government policies, and so forth. Uh, so at USC, you know, through the many centers and institutes that bring together top-notch experts, and some of whom you've heard from this morning, uh, we've been developing ways of offering versatile and scalable solutions to some of these issues, and, and we are setting the vision. Uh, we're trying to set the research vision to achieve that. For example, in the Center for Sustainability Solutions, uh, which was officially launched just over a year ago, uh, under the support of Viterbi School and the Price School and the Provost Office, um, we are seeking to develop solutions to interfaces of natural and physical sciences, as well as engineering and public 
uh, health and public policy and economics and such. One of the things that we have been working on with other members of this panel, actually, it's been a great uh, point of joy and pride uh, for me uh, personally and also for, for the center is using AI for developing sustainable water systems. So I'm going to stop here and I hope that we can get back to uh, water systems and infrastructure and how uh, through AI research we can, uh, we can help it, we can impact it and come up with solutions. Oh yeah, we're gonna delve deep into that. Thank you, Mata. So Deborah, would you like to introduce yourself uh, for a few minutes? Sure, um, so my name is Deborah Kida. I'm a research scientist at the Information Sciences Institute. Um, I'm actually a climate scientist by training. I got my undergraduate degree and my, and my PhD in earth sciences, uh, the last one from USC. Uh, mostly I work in the paleoclimate domain and the idea is how can we actually use the rich uh, data that we can extract from the earth to try to understand the baseline for climate compared to what we're actually seeing today. Uh, so most of my work uh, at the frontier of AI has come from uh, moving the data around. It's not a big data problem. We actually use data sets themselves are very small but they actually work across a variety of subjects from chemistry to geology to um, sedimentology, to pretty much everything you can think of is involved in paleoclimatology, as well as trying to actually enter the big data world in terms of how do we uh, make inferences from our data and how can we actually um, uh, link with uh, climate data and, and projection of, of future climate. Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate that. We'll we'll dive in, I think, to some topics that'll be of, of great interest related to that. So, John, uh, please introduce yourself, and uh, you know you have the floor for the next few minutes. Thank you. So, I'm I'm John Wilson. Uh, I'm uh, my day job is director of the Special Sciences Institute that I founded 11 years ago. Uh, we have lots of research and lots of academic programs. Uh, but I'm trained as a geographer. Uh, I still do do geographic work, but most of my work revolves around trying to understand how things uh, vary and move and are represented across space, but also time. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, there's a natural tension between these two worlds, human and natural, uh, sort of a, not a very good description, but nonetheless, you know, sustainability touches on both. You can't build a sustainable system for people without thinking of the natural world and vice versa. And, uh, you know, I'm lucky enough at USC to have a series of faculty appointments that extend from engineering to letters, arts and science to medical school and then to architecture, which is really about uh, design. And so it's not just about describing what's wrong with the world or how the world works, but what could we do to make it work better? And in that sense, you know, lately I've been working on projects in food insecurity, about water and about green infrastructure. And, and increasingly much of my work centers around using uh, health, human health is either the driver for that work or one of the outcomes of that work. And I think that's enough. Thanks, John. And I'm going to I'm going to pivot uh, to the panel uh, and lead kind of a series of topics and discussions and get some you know feedback from this uh, excellent group. So, so I'm going to introduce uh, an interesting you know challenge. I think that's on everyone's mind. I'll tell you a little quick story. Uh, JPL used to have, so my day jobs at JPL, I work at NASA, it's a beautiful campus in La Cunada, Flint Ridge, Pasadena, California. And before the pandemic, everyone's, you know, we're talking about su sustainability and, you know, what, what sort of the pandemic and post-pandemic world may look like related to this and su sustainability. And so JPL used to have a big parking problem. Uh, we, you know, in any given day, we had 750 people that were illegally parked and we just allowed it because there was nothing we could do. It's federal land. Uh, you know, we can't to do to build a new building, it requires a decadal survey, you know, to build a new parking structure and things. And so the guards just kind of let it happen. But in, in the future, going into the hybrid workplace and thinking how work changed and how everyone's thinking about that kind of nowadays, we really anticipate not having as much of a, a parking problem, you know, related to this. And that's just one of the elements, you know, maybe you know, technology has accelerated people working differently. How how do you think technology? Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be AI and data science, but the areas you guys are all researching and working with, how do you think it'll affect basically, you know, still maintaining productivity and still making great contributions, you know, in this, in this post or, or soon to be, you know, uh, you know, this pandemic and post pandemic world. Well, I can start by saying, uh, how could it not? 
have a role. I mean, think about why we were able to at least partially survive and thrive in the past year. It really was because of the technology. We you know, uh, were able to keep pace of progress and a lot of the research we do. And in fact, a lot of uh, the issues related to sustainability perhaps were even more highlighted because of the way we uh, realized that we could interact. So I think uh, whether it's a tool or <laughs> even a means by itself, uh, there must be a role. Uh, and of course, you know, when we talk about sustainability, we can talk about it in, on so many different um, fronts. I mean, we, you know, already the issues or, or the topics of the natural system and the human system were brought up. Uh, our infrastructure you know, has been mentioned, health systems were mentioned. Um, so it's everywhere. Uh, and I mean, I hate to just you know, say generalities, but you know, that's the big picture. It's, it's there. Yeah, you know, another thing that it's highlighted, and I'm interested in John's opinion on this too, since you're studying the you know social and, and human aspect of this is that technology has allowed us to go remote which has had all these secondary and tertiary effects like less parking you know load and things like that but it's also highlighted some social elements too related to technology and disparities related to that john how do you think that that's you know kind of coming up you know or, or will play a role in in the next five years related to how technology helps kind of get us out of this in a sustainable way how do those disparities how do we how do we take those into account? Well, I think, uh, well, that's a really hard question, but I think the University of Southern California maybe already faces the, the first question and need to answer a question uh, related to your parking example. So I think under study right now at USC is which staff can work remotely and which staff need to be on campus. And, you know, if you work remotely, then you save the time spent commuting, you save the commuting costs. Uh, and if you're told to work on campus, you have the commuting time, the commuting cost, and then traditionally the university has asked you to pay for parking, right? And so, you know, uh, technology in this case and the flexibility in terms of work styles and so forth might create some new inequalities that people are going to, you know, rise up and, and argue that are unfair. Uh, but, you know, I think I think the, the past 15 months has exacerbated the inequalities that are, that are spread across society because typically the inequalities are, are a representation and, and, and infiltrate all aspects of life. And so, you know, I think, uh, you know, we, we have to find some ways to, to even up the playing field. And, uh, you know, obviously across the world, but particularly in the United States, this is a super contentious issue. Uh, but but I, I, I can, uh, we, we often work in disadvantaged neighborhoods and I, I think, you know, we'd, we'd find a different story there uh, talking about the past 15 months than we would, for example, Chris, where you and I live. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, John. And it's so important to kind of consider that too, as we're doing research in this domain. And I know, I know you're strongly, uh, you know, considering that. And so I appreciate that, you know, Talking about secondary and tertiary effects to things like parking and, and climate, Deborah, I'm, I'm thinking about some of your research and, and some of the pictures in the early parts, at least in March 20, April 20 of the pandemic and thinking about it here in LA uh, with respect to sustainability. You know, it's like you saw instead of the smog in downtown LA, you know, they showed pictures, everything's greener, everything's nice, you know, and I'm, I'm reminded of those pictures of the Venice canals that turned out to be fake, but there were dolphins swimming in that because it's so clean now because no one's going out anymore. Um, did the earth really get cleaner during COVID? And, you know, what have you, what have you seen as anything kind of jumped out in your research? And is there any technological bend to that, you know, or, or AI or data science? I think the most, the, the biggest impact was on our uh, nitrogen oxide emissions. So things that are coming out of cars, so actually any transportation, uh, really. So the fact that we traveled less, and I'm not just going to include cars, but I'm going to include planes in this um, quite a bit. I think most of our carbon footprint right now comes from planes and not cars uh, for us, for, for most of us traveling. Uh, so we definitely saw an effect. Actually, there's a lot of NASA study, um, but it's very short lived. I mean, I think now we're back to regular emissions. So the question is, how do we keep uh, sustaining this? Uh, and I think that's a very good research question. Uh, and again, it's going to be bringing uh, inequalities issues. Do we all have access to internet? Do we all have access to a workplace that's remote? 
Uh, I'm seeing it the other way where we might actually increase accessibility as well. If something is available online and you can't travel to it, uh, then you might actually have access to it. So not only it's going to reduce the carbon footprint, um, it's also going to help uh, increase access to communities who might not otherwise have it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that those are so important to kind of take into context. I, you know, speaking of, of NASA and Earth science data, you know, as it relates to this, one of the frequent comments I hear, and it makes a lot of sense to me, but it might not totally, you know, make sense to the audience. So I'll try and explain it real quick and then pun it over to, to Mata for some follow on is everyone tells me it's like, well, it's really hard to use remote sensing data. Uh, you know, when it's taken, it's uh, in these, you know, different formats that, you know, it's, if you're more of someone dealing with, say, geographic information systems, or you're familiar with cartographic maps and stuff, you look at an orbital swath uh, of data, and you're like, what the heck is this? And, you know, and it's in this weird format, and, you know, I don't get it. So, so accessibility is so important, too, in thinking about, you know, how we make this data in such a way so that you know it's more like a map or it mm -hmm. you know has uh if you interrogate it you know data in all spatial grid cells at all times and then what happens when you do that you know you're algorithmically doing this and and things like that so so mata nasa is flying a number of new missions with better instruments than ever and we're going to have even more data about the planet's health and so can you speak a little bit to this as to what types of measurements are coming that you're excited about or that you think can help us as we try and understand sustainability related to this? Uh, sure, Chris. And you brought up uh, several key points here uh, that I'd like to touch on quickly. Uh, first of all, regarding what kind of what kinds of data are, are available, as you know probably better than me, um, range is huge. We, you know, NASA satellites and other space agencies as well and other government agencies here are producing a huge um, array of things that impact our weather prediction weather forecasting climate predictions i mean things from cloud cover and precipitation to state of the oceans uh, carbon in the atmosphere um, soil moisture biomass things like that so the range is huge and they all go into different uh, modeling uh, activity of computational models depend on the data that come down from these satellites. So the application is already there, it's huge. However, no, you, what you brought up um, um, first was, it was really key in that, um, who uses these data? What are the formats? How accessible are these things? Sure, a lot of the government models, large scale weather forecasting models, for example, taking data and they have established pathways for doing that. But the general population really does not have access to such data. Not that they don't have access, but most people don't know even where to begin to, to use these data. And from the remote sensing community side, that's perhaps something that we can take on as an action. How do we make these, these data and the resulting information more accessible, more meaningful to a larger swath of people? Uh, and, and that's where I think more progress would be enabled. I mean, the more people have access to information, the more, I mean, if, if we increase this Brownian motion and, you know, the, uh, the, the availability of knowledge to people, the more we can gain. You know, I was talking to uh, a, um, a, a major crop grower uh, in California a couple of weeks ago, and this person was a, a farm manager. And it's not a farm, it's, it's a permanent crop, like tree type crop manager. And he was saying that, you know, they, and they own thousands and thousands of acres. And I was talking to him about, okay, how, how can we help <laughs> with remote sensing products? Uh, can, can we give you information about soil moisture, for example, or crop health? And he was saying that, well, in their farm, he's extremely interested in technology, except that people he works with, just they don't know how to use it. And it's very expensive for them to gain access to these data in terms of overcoming the barriers of knowledge and, and the tools. So uh, you know, to expect that people would do this on their own accord, it's, it's not reasonable. You know, we have to, so that's, I think that's one aspect we can help uh, from the technology to make that available to uh, a larger number or larger cross sections of our society. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Mata. And, um, you know, the measurements are so important. And speaking of, you know, farmers and the food and ag industry, you know, there's a lot of talk, too, about sustainable ag 
you know, right now and what types of mitigations and interventions are, are possible. And the first step is it starts with the measurements, you know, teaching, uh, you know, the farmers in the ag of what's happening, but also then, you know, it, there has to be sort of, uh, you know, business model case, uh, you know, for them to change the way that they're doing things. You know, it's, it's too much as talked about just directly, you know, snapping your fingers and changing out decades of the way that people work. And that's very difficult. And so, John, I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on this. I'm interested in your perspective on what types of interventions are possible in, in the food and ag industry, which ones are feasible and affordable, and then how can, how can technology, you know, help us, uh, you know, in terms of this? Okay. The questions again. So let me try maybe two answers. The, the first one would be to say that my PhD was about uh, describing landscape change uh, over a pretty big watershed in Ontario and Canada over 175 years. So from when Europeans arrived to the 1980s when you know, uh, the favorite sort of lake that Toronto residents went for a summer vacation was covered in algae. And why the hell was this happening, right? But, uh, but, but before the Europeans came, the whole area was a mixed deciduous evergreen forest, right? And so, but, it, but after that was cut down, then you had this agriculture that didn't have the benefit of electricity. It didn't have gasoline. It didn't have tractors. It had farm animals and lots of labor. And you use crop rotation so that you control things like pests and so forth. Over a hundred years, we've migrated to a system whereby we use little, as little human input as possible, and we use agriculture has been industrialized. So we 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 don't worry about the soil quality. We just worry about bringing the right amount of fertilizer. We don't worry about whether the, whether the rainfall is adequate. We just build big aqueducts and dams and bring the water. And and you know. In the longer term, we need measurement to drive change and to inform change. But, but we also need a, co a commitment on the part of people about how systems work and which systems are sustainable over the medium to long term and resilient at the same time. Because so much of how we've constructed the world now is based on how we understood the world in, in the early 20th century. And we understand the world in far more nimble ways now and what we want to do is to take these new technologies and align it with them, right? So that's one part of my answer. If I'm allowed a second part, the second part would be that, you know, the success of GIS, for example, is predicated on its use as a system of record, uh, a system of insight, and a system of engagement, right? And, you know, increasingly remote sensing data are being ingested into a GIS and used in those three frames. Right In the academy, most people think GIS is about a system of insight. And we can, we can augment that now by adding geo-inspired artificial intelligence and machine learning and other things. And some people in the audience I know are, uh, are leading some of that work, right? But we also have to think about the role of this as a system of record and particularly as a system for engagement. And so the, the engagement question to me and the answer to sort of what Marta was talking about is maybe yeah, and given changes in technology is that we no longer need to think about sharing uh, the data as it's acquired, but we should be thinking about at what point in the processing workflow is the data ready for sort of prime time consumption, right? And, you know, it's, 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 it's possibly some, you know, high end products at the end, but it doesn't necessarily need to be that. And so in a, a good example of something that's pretty timely and thoughtful is, of course, the COVID-19 uh, website that Johns Hopkins built. You know, there's lots of data going at that. There's lots of uh, uh, high-end analysis and, and interpretation that are being done with some, at least, of those data. And it's, and you know, arguably, that's the single most popular use of the kinds of things that people like me do ever in the history of the planet and human civilization. So, you know, now that was spawned by crisis. Can, can, can we build a similar commitment just based on opportunity? That's, that's really the question at hand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, John. That's such a, that's such a great example is that Hopkins website, you know, kind of related to that. Deborah, I want to think about this sort of in the vein of, you know, 
when and where you get data from and this pipeline like like John was talking about. And we always talk about what data is available, but we don't always talk about what data is missing. And so I'm really kind of interested in your opinion, you know, from paleo climate and, and things and looking at it in the lens of sustainability. What, what data is missing? Uh, you know, what don't you have that you wish you had as a scientist? And, and is there any way that technology helps us get there? I would say more data, like longer data sets, being able to actually observe essentially on thousand year time scale or even longer. So this is where paleo comes in, but in the case of paleo, we only have like very little um, amount of data. So being able to uh, augment that data somehow. So either with hybrid models, so having like a physics-based model kind of being helped by the paleo climate data to kind of augment that data set. So that's one way. The other way would be to actually look at our physics-based model and see if we can actually include some uh, machine learning or deep learning in that case, uh, in that sense, uh, to be able to make use of that limited data, but at least we have that data. So I think to me, that's gonna be th those hybrid uh, kind of data, machine learning and physics-based model are gonna be uh, really needed. As far as the data that we need itself is uh, being able to look at different backgrounds. So not just like the last 30 years, we've already been influenced by greenhouse gas change. So what is the baseline? What does it look like when there is no change in uh, atmospheric greenhouse gases or very little change? On the other hand, what does it look like when we have uh, a thousand ppm in the atmosphere? Things like this. So being able to actually uh, move on from like one background condition to another and doing it uh, very rapidly. Uh, so that's more like on the climate side. On the uh, more like consumer side, it would be nice to be able to keep track of where the water is going. So we kind of know how much water is falling down on the earth, but where it's actually going, how much are we using, how much are farmers using? I think this is still big questions that we need to answer. So be able to monitor this. And I think Madam might, might, might be able to uh, talk more about this. Uh, being able to see where our greenhouse gases are going, where they're coming from, like how much in each sector uh, exactly, and being able to pinpoint it. I think those are the two uh, biggest challenges that we need. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and you know, just since you teed it up, um, you know, I'm just going to touch on it. Uh, you know, as we think about, too, how our modeling techniques may uh, adapt, you know, in the age of, of newer types of models, uh, like you, you talked about, say, the difference between physics-based, you know, for full physics model, where we understand a lot about, say, the features we're trying to model in the climate system, and we think about that ahead of time because they all conform to some type of laws and, and this and that, versus sort of, uh, you know, and so we spend a lot of time even just understanding what we're going to do before we do it, uh, you know, as opposed to, and, you know, I don't want to throw it out there, but the Wild West of uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm making fun of myself here, but the wild west of deep learning and machine learning where we just throw data at it, uh, or as some people might say, uh, and we don't care as much about the feature engineering, but we throw some, some types of, say, neural models at this and kind of see what comes out, puts such an onus, I think, on explainability, uh, you know, which I think is so important, you know, when you're doing this, when you apply these techniques, you know, instead of thinking carefully about the physics or the features. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm being a little facetious here. I'm not saying all of that is bad. The deep learning techniques are amazing when you have this infinite supply of data that's out there on the internet. You, the refinement of that data as oil, you know, you can think about it like Andrew Yang talks about data as the new oil becomes so important in those pipelines as does the explainability kind of out the other end. Um, and so I wanna use your great comment too, Deborah, to kind of pivot a little bit, you know, to what, what you're talking about you know, in terms of the water, uh, you know, related to that and, and, and Mata's background and, and expertise, as we think about, you know, again, measurements and the relationship between the climate and the water as it relates to sustain sustainability, I, I'd love for you to opine a little on that, Mata, uh, you know, with your background. So th there's no doubt in anyone's mind, I think that water is going to be a huge um, point of contention, it already is uh, across the world, I mean, we already see it in, even in California. Uh, we have, I mean, in the cities, we have issues. I mean, we have, um, uh, you know, we were, everyone's worried about day zero in uh, Cape Town a couple of years ago. And I'm thinking, okay, when's going to, when's going to happen to LA? Uh, you know, hopefully nothing like that will happen, but the problems we have in the cities are nothing compared to what's going to happen in the rural areas and with agriculture, which uses uh, 70 or 80% of the, the total fresh water supply. The freshwater supply, you know, is 
it's uh, by some accounts dwindling. Uh, you know, we lose some of it to uh, to the ocean, you know, join salt water. So it's it's kind of a, the, the the balance is definitely not going in the right direction right now. And unless we do something quick, we're going to be facing more and more issues, uh, both environmental issues and both the human uh, you know, existence and well-being issues. Uh, so yeah, we definitely need some sort of a closed loop system here. We uh, we need uh, a closed loop system that is informed by our observations. So we need to observe, and you mentioned that earlier, Chris, we need to uh, uh, measure things. So we have to know what the state of, what are the dynamics looking into the future, learning from the past and going to the future. And then how do we use this knowledge to um, better understand the system and then come up with solutions to, uh, to better managing the system? Now, as relates to AI, uh, and I'm not an AI expert, uh, I, um, you know, uh, I sort of hope that by osmosis, I learn a few things. Uh, or you play one on TV, you play one on TV, go on. <laughs> not even that. <laughs> But the, the issue, and you know, some of the talks this morning also mentioned that, that uh, some of the, at least some of the AI uh, and machine learning methods, they don't address the causality. So we don't necessarily understand the cause and effect. And that's where the physics of the problem comes in. So for those who do the physics-based modeling to join forces with data sciences, I think that's where the key will be. We have to somehow marry these things. And I know there's already a lot of effort in that area. But if, it, if, if I were to put my finger on one thing that um, we should focus on, at least from the academic side and bring in all the expertise, that would be it uh, for water systems, for example. So we have remote sensing. We know how to measure uh, you know, with, with uncertainty bars around it. We know how to do soil moisture, for example. Uh, we know how to do um, precipitation. So we have the elements of the water cycle that we can observe we know some of the physics behind of those. I mean, our physics models, if you think of it, really going back decades or centuries, how were these models generated? People observed, people just stared at phenomena and put equations down that would capture what they observed. And that's great. I mean, we, we owe those scientists a lot. Maybe we can do that again, maybe now with more data and with machine learning and AI helping us improve our physics-based understanding while not letting either one really uh, take the driver's seat. I mean, at different points in time, one of them would, but having this collaboration between physics and data sciences, I think that's something that hopefully we can uh, focus on going forward. Mata, I couldn't agree with you more. And it's so important to think of this as sort of a whole cloth, you know, type of approach, which is, you know, kind of the way I think you're talking about it. And you're talking about things like water and soil moisture and also different modeling techniques and how we bring that together. John, um, you know, this is this is a big this is a big system of systems problem, you know, in the way that we think about it. And I want to approach you with the systems of systems challenge. Uh, in the past month, you know, the administration has spent a lot of time and in fact even held a climate summit uh, in it. They're talking about international participation and cooperation and trying to, you know, reduce emissions globally. This is also a system of systems problem and that some commitments have been made, uh, you know, and how do we get to things like net zero, uh, you know, emissions by the 2030s. And obviously this is a big challenge. I mean, the US signing up for doing things like this versus the entire world some of which is still going through, you know, its age of industrialization. How do the technologies that you're talking about in terms of GIS and also just the whole discussion we've had, uh, you know, in terms of you considering things as well as social public policy aspects to this, how can technology policy and that whole cloth approach help us as we consider that related to uh, uh, the net zero by the 2030s? Well, I think, uh, you know, you need to, you need, you need to build, you need to use technology to build views of the world, views of systems of systems like Hopkins have done with the COVID site. You know, in the water space, uh, the Department of Interior has done something, something similar with the so-called national water model. And so it has the United States uh, resolved to very small kind of sub watersheds. Uh, it, it has a, a time window that extends to the next hour, the next three hours, the next day, the next 30 days. Uh, and, it, and it has different levels of uncertainty depending on 
how far into the future you want to look. Uh, but the idea was to try and build a synoptic view that scientists would be comfortable with and that, you know, among other people, public safety uh, for, uh, personnel would be, would be comfortable with because there are examples of, of paramedics and, and police that go to rescue people in, in floods that themselves die because they had no actionable information about how big the flood was or where it was or how fast it was going to come. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have the data and we have uh, the horsepower in terms of our computational systems as well as uh, the people that run them to, to be able to answer those questions in near real time. And so, you know, I think, you know, if we wanted to do that in a purposeful and, and a purposeful way, and we need to be able to marshal the resort, marshal the data, organize the data, be able to, to present it in a way that people can digest it. And then at the same time, make a commitment to measuring performance. Because, you know, universities, seems to me in the 40 years I've been part of them, uh, often they stand up and say, we're going to do this because if we build it, they will come. And they typically mean the students, but sometimes they mean the research goers. And, you know, that's a pretty dumb way to make many, many, many tens of millions of dollars in investments, right? We, we could have done it in a much more <coughs> way, got further uh, using less resources. So I, 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 I see a, a, a lot of possibilities and to, to what Deborah was talking about earlier, and with colleagues in China, we have a paper that's I think demonstrated that in 2020, spring came eight days earlier across all of China. And that's largely because you took the cars off the road, the air and shut down all the factories, so the air was cleaner, and so there was more sunshine and and warmer temperatures, and the plants responded. So so that's a one-time thing, but but it does demonstrate I think that if if we could go down this road that the administration hopes to go down. We don't have to wait 100 years to see the out beneficial outcomes of that. We might see some of them um, more or less immediately, and maybe that will change the, the benefit cost uh, ratio. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more, John. And um, additionally, you know, one, one thing to kind of consider in this whole of approach, you know, aspect that we're talking about, and I want to be mindful, we've got about eight minutes left here in the panel. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you uh, as panelists with, with uh, sort of a a last topic and then ask for your feedback from each of you for your kind of closing arguments kind of related to that. So much of what we talk about with sustainability and, and, and climate and measuring things and measuring what matters depends on, you know, believe it or not, another potentially controversial area as we think about our earth, which is space. <laughs> Lots of people ask, well, why are we doing things in space? And, you know, we should be considering, you know, the earth and, you know, my typical answer back to them on that is to show them a graph that shows the technological advancements that have been you know, achieved from space and then transition back to improving our lives at Earth, not just the measurements that we're talking about, but things like your iPhone camera, you know, or, or even other things you know, that are just part of everyday life that came from you know, the, the technology investment in space. So given all the things, Deborah, that are going on, and we'll start with you, Deborah, and then we'll go to, to Mata and then to John to kind of wrap it up. You know, given people talking about things like virtual space tourism, food sustainability in space, as we think about exploring or potentially sending uh, humans back to the moon and back to Mars, uh, you know, space junk as a conservation kind of aspect. These are just a few of the topics of sustainability in, in space. So, so Deborah, I'd like to begin with your thoughts on that. Uh, you know, how do you think sustainability applies there? And then we'll go to Mata and to John with our remaining six minutes. I think I'm going to agree with you, like most of it is coming from, it's a self-contained problem in a lot of ways that we have to have a technological answer for, and then we can take that technological answer and bring it to work, essentially. Uh, so I think, you know, food sustainability is something that we can actually learn from, like how do you grow food in space? And that's something we can probably take on earth and actually use less space uh, or less resources and less energy to grow our own food. So I think to me, that's, that's what the lessons that we can learn on, on top of having measurements and having the satellites actually helping us out with, with that. Thank you, Deborah. And, and Mata, any thoughts on you know, space junk or any of those other topics or space tourism or how it applies? Yeah. I, do, I do actually have it. It's kind of a, a philosophical 
topic here besides the um, a lot of technologies that you and Deborah mentioned that the, the, there's a lot of uh, uh, benefits uh, coming from research into space um, systems. But thinking about sustainability, what do we really mean by sustainability? What is, what's the end goal? I mean, we want uh, the human society, the human population, the human race to thrive. I mean, that's really ultimately the purpose of discussing sustainability at all. And part of that, a huge part of it, is enriching lives. I mean, that's also one of the National Academy's uh, topics. It's you know, mentioned in the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. It's ultimately really enriching lives is what we want. And part of that is through answering fundamental questions about the universe, you know, what's, you know, where do we come from, where are we going? Those are never ending questions. And um, we have to do that. Ultimately, I mean, this, this is what it's like asking, okay, arts and humanities. I mean, those are fabrics of existence of humans and society. It's not just technology. We have to, uh, technology enables progress, uh, but ultimately it has to serve uh, human lives and, and enriching lives. So that's how I really see it from it, kind of a, the you know, many tens of thousands of kilometers up. That's that's, where, that's where we wanted you to answer from. That was perfect. <laughs> And uh, thank you, Mata. And so, John, you know, you're probably going to be, after, you know, with whatever time left, I'll, I'll close it out. But our last kind of, uh, you know, opinion and opining on this. What, what are your thoughts? Well, I think, I think, in my, in, from my vantage point, I think space is sort of the wild, wild west. And so, the the difficulty in the current framework is that there are no kind of international agreements. There are no sort of fair play rules, and so. You could you could use it uh, for you know these fundamental discoveries and so forth, but you could also use it to cause harm in the world. Uh, you know, uh, many of the satellites that are circling the Earth, are so we can learn what other people are doing. Uh, maybe because we have reason not to trust them, or we just don't trust them. And this, if we're doing that, for, say to somebody, then somebody's doing that to us. So uh, and you know, sometimes people have pitched the idea, well, we we should just move all our, war, our disagreements and wars to space and handle them that way. Uh, you know, on the flip side, uh, you know, to Marta's point, you know, and to your point about the benefits we derive, uh, you know, many, many game changes over the course of human history, whether on Earth or in space, come from serendipity. So you, you try something and you have one set of aspirations in mind and Lo and behold, you learn something else that's as valuable or more valuable than what you set out to learn. And so, you know, I think exploration has an important role in this, in the, in, in the human mind and in, in, in terms of where humanity might go. So, but that's a tough question. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's, it's not a tough panel, it's an amazing panel. And so I hope everyone here in the audience has really enjoyed this. I know I have. Um, there's a few minutes left, but I want to finish on time and be very respectful and hand it back to Yolanda, our MC. But uh, I want to thank the panelists first. So thank you to Mata and to Deborah and to John. This has been a very stimulating and rousing discussion. I hope uh, everyone here has found it useful. I have. And uh, I would like to hand the baton, I think, with about a minute left back to uh, our MC, uh, Dr. Yolanda Gill, and uh, any announcements that she has. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all. Thank you, Deborah and Mata and John. And thank you, Chris, for uh, giving us um, uh, this perspective on sustainability that covered both uh, topics that we all have in mind, uh, such as climate, such as improving the way that we're sensing the environment, but also thinking more broadly and brainstorming about uh, new topics and how do we understand the human factors in sustainability and, and taking us to space, my goodness, uh, very exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you all.